Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we all desire to be in your kingdom, in that new Jerusalem, in that holy city. We all desire that our names may be written in the Lamb's book of life. As we continue studying here, Father, from your word, I ask that you open our hearts, our minds, and that you remove the devil and his angels from this sanctuary and any distractions. In the powerful name of Jesus, I ask. Amen. Amen. If you join me in opening to Revelation 14, where our scripture was, the third angel's message, Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11. Here the Bible says, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, a loud voice. Don't miss that. This isn't a quiet warning. Actually, no warning is a quiet warning. With a loud voice. And what did it say? If anyone worship the beast or his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full. Don't miss that. Full strength into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascend forever and ever and they have no rest day or night who worships the beast and receives his mark and whoever receives the mark of his name. Friends, this is the most Serious warning in the entire Bible. You will not find a more severe and serious warning in all of Scripture than this. The most serious warning in all the Bible is basically saying everyone who gets the mark of the beast is going to be lost without exception. We just read it right here. Everyone who gets the mark of the beast will be lost. It even gives descriptions. They'll be tormented, they'll be burned, they'll be destroyed. And not just in the presence of the angels, but in the presence of Jesus Himself. Everyone who gets this, my friends, will be lost without exception. And we've been looking at Revelation chapter 13. And today we're going to focus on the mark of the beast. And those who get, I'm sorry, this beast has focused his wrath on those that keep the commandments of God. This beast has focused his wrath on those that keep the commandments of God. Look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. It tells us, just a couple of chapters before, that the devil and the dragon was enraged. Enraged is really an understatement. with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offsprings who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here the devil is enraged with commandment keepers. Those who get the mark of the beast will choose the commandments of men above the commandments of God. And there will be a fine line drawn, friends, and there will be two groups. Those who say, those who say we will obey God and His law, and those who say we will follow tradition. We, we will follow tradition. And let me just, let, me just let, let you know that the majority are going to follow tradition. The majority are going to follow tradition. And keep this in mind, young people, and older people, that we do not follow the majority. The majority of the time, the majority is wrong. <laughs> the majority of the time, the majority is wrong. So, so keep that in mind, whether it's something outside of the church or even inside of the church. The majority of the time, the majority is wrong. So Revelation there, chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, the most severe warning 
But notice verse 12. You see, verse 9 through 11 tells us what's going to happen to those who receive the mark of the beast and receive his image on their, on their, on their hand and on their forehead. But then verse 12 says, But over here, what? But over here is the patience of the saints. And over here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Do you see those two groups? There, Revelation 14 verse 9. A loud warning. If anyone worships the beast and receives the, and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God poured out in full strength. And then in verse 12 it says, But over here, but over here are the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God. Is commandment is keeping the commandments crucial in this in, in these two groups? Absolutely. One group keeps the commandments. It is evident that the mark of the beast comes with the greatest condemnation, friends. The greatest condemnation. Those who receive the mark of the beast and those those who will receive the mark of the beast are those who will receive the greatest Condemnations, but from God. From God. Right there, we just read it. Drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out in full strength. If you turn to Revelation 16, verse 1 and 2. You see, the seven last plagues only fall on those who have the mark of the beast. And we're going to get to a study on the seven last plagues. But just looking briefly here, Revelation 16, verse 1 and 2. There the Bible says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the, the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of who? Of God on the earth. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and, and loathsome sore came upon men, who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. The seven last plagues will fall on those who have the mark of the beast. A severe condemnation from God. And every time God has sent out his wrath in the past, even in scripture and even today, it's mixed with mercy. It's, it's mixed with mercy. But when the final time comes... And probation is closed. It will be too late, friends. It will be too late. And Revelation 22, verse 11. When, when Revelation 22, verse 11 is fulfilled. There where it says that he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. When that time comes, no more sermons. No more going to church. It's too late because the door of the ark is closed. The door of the ark is shut and the wrath of God comes unmixed with mercy. No mercy. The full wrath of God here. Revelation 14. Is this, is this serious, friends? You better believe it is. It is serious, serious warning. So, for, to understand the mark of the beast, to understand the mark of the beast, we need, to, we need to see and understand the seal of God. And keeping in mind that the devil has a counterfeit for everything that Jesus does. Every single thing. In, in, in our previous study on Christ or Antichrist, we saw that, Christ, that God sent his representative on earth and his helper, the Holy Spirit. We also saw that, that the devil has his representative. There, Revelation 13, the first beast. And then the helper, the second beast of Revelation 13. We see even in the ministry that he has, that he counterfeits the ministry of Jesus. Jesus began his ministry coming out of the water when he was baptized. This Antichrist power begins his work coming out of the sea. Jesus' ministry was for three and a half years. This beast ministry or work was for three and a half prophetic years. Jesus received a deadly wound but was resurrected, praise the Lord. 
this beast receives a deadly wound and it will be healed. It is being healed. And so there we see a counterfeit of everything that Jesus does. Everything that Jesus does. So if God has a seal for his people, the devil is also going to have his seal, his mark. So turn with me to Revelation uh, chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. And we're going to see exactly what is this seal of God. Because you see, when, when you know the authentic, everything else is a counterfeit. You don't have to worry about um, first figuring out all the different types of counterfeits. If you know how the authentic and the real looks, then everything else is a fake. So, Revelation chapter, chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. The Bible here says, And these things, and these things I... S- no, after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on the trees. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. Are you with me? Having the seal of who? The living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. By the way, friends, this is right now where we are in prophetic time. Right now, 2015, September, is where we are. These angels are out sealing God's people. And verse 3 says, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Right now, the angels are literally holding the wrath of God. And God is saying, just wait just one more time. There, I, I have others that haven't been sealed and are going to get sealed. Just wait just a little bit. And the angels are holding the winds there. They're just waiting for the command for God, said, for God to say, it's time. And then they will release. But here, we see that they will be sealed where? In their forehead, right? Seal, do not harm the earth and the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. Notice Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Here we see verse 1. It says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their forehead. And so here we we can get an idea that that the seal of God written in the forehead has to do with the name of God written in the forehead. See, Revelation 14, verse 1 says that he saw... These 144,000 standing with God, with His Father's name written on their foreheads. The seal of God has to do with the name of God. With the name of God. Because in Bible, in the Bible, in the Bible, names represent character. A character. So, turn with me to Exodus chapter 33. What is a character of God? What is a name of God? If that's going to be sealed in the forehead, then what is it? Exodus chapter 33. There we see that the angels are sealing God's people on their forehead. And there we saw that God's people have God's name on their foreheads. Exodus chapter 33. You remember this, you may remember this instance where Moses is talking to God and Moses says, Show me your glory. Chapter 33, verse 18. Here Moses said, and he said, Please show me your glory. Then he, this is God, say, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the what? The name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And then later on he goes on to describe that you cannot see my face and die. I will hide you behind the rock. But notice in verse I'm sorry, chapter 34, verse 1. Just right after that, God tells Moses to do something. He says, And then, and, and the Lord said to Moses, Cut two tablets of stones like the first ones, 
And I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Which tablets did, Mo did Moses break? The Ten Commandments. Yes, God's law. And so here Moses goes back to God and says, show me your glory. And God says, I will make my goodness pass and I will proclaim my name before you. And by the way, go back down, cut two stones, and I will write again what I wrote on the ones that you broke before. So then Moses goes and cuts the stones, comes back the next morning. Notice verse 5. Verse 5. After he writ, there it says, Then the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. He proclaimed the name of the Lord. God's name is the same as His character, which is the same as His law. Moses says, show me your glory. And God says, no, I will proclaim my name to you. Go back down, give me, two, give me the two stones. I will write my name and I will proclaim my name to you. So God's name is the same as His character, which is the same as His law. So God's people will be sealed in their foreheads with the, His law. Amen? With His divine law. Those people who receive God's seal are those who keep God's holy law. Friends, and that's why if we turn back to Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, makes sense. Revelation 12, verse 17, where the devil is enraged... And he went to make war with those who keep the commandments of God. Why is he angry with those? Because they keep the commandments of God. The commandments of God represent the character of God, the name of God, the seal of God. And he is angry with those. And the devil hates any commandment keepers. He hates any commandment keepers. So that's why in Revelation 14 verses 9 through 12... Here, the third angel is warning us. If anyone worship the beast or has his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out in full strength. And that's why verse 12 says, Here is the patience. Here are those who keep the commandments of God. Here are those who keep the commandments of God. Keeping the commandments of God is the opposite of having the mark of the, of the beast. Keeping the commandments of God is the opposite of having the mark of the beast. If I keep the commandments of God and have faith in Jesus, it is impossible, friends, for me to have the mark of the beast. Impossible. I want you to make sure you really understand this. Here, Revelation 14, verse 12. There are two groups. Those who have the mark of the beast and the, and the wrath of God is poured out full strength, no mercy. We really don't know what that's like. We do not know. Anything that we may go through now, has God gives us mercy. His mercy. But here, is no mercy in full strength. So there's that group. And then here is the patience of the saints those who keep the commandments of God. So if you are keeping the commandments of God, you are obviously not in this group who has the mark of the beast. Is that making sense? Amen. Amen. So which... Now, in the commandments of God, which is the commandment that tells us, that tells you which God you serve? It's the fourth commandment. It's the fourth commandment. If you join me there in Exodus chapter 20. You see... While you're going to Exodus chapter 20, an atheist can abstain from stealing. Can he? Someone who, yeah, sure. An atheist can not steal. A Buddhist can not murder. Does that make them a Christian? Not necessarily. Exodus chapter 20. In the Bible, there is a sign that shows that you are a worshiper of Jesus as creator and redeemer. And that sign is the Sabbath. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Here it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. 
But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you nor your sons, nor your daughters, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. And then God tells us why. Because in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, because of that, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So God here is telling us, keep the Sabbath day holy. Why? Because I am the creator of everything. And when we keep the Sabbath, we are recognizing that God is my creator. God is my creator. Turn with me now to Deuteronomy chapter 5. And there we see the law of God again. Deuteronomy is uh, the root word is duo, which is a copy or a repetition. And there we see Deuteronomy chapter 5, the Ten Commandments repeated again. But notice, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, there's a different reason why we keep the fourth commandment. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12. It says, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your maid servant nor your ox nor your donkey nor any of your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates that your maid servants, maid servant and your manservant may rest as well as you. And then here, verse 15, it tells us why. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, therefore, because of that, the Lord your God commands you to keep the Sabbath day. Do you see the difference between Deuteronomy 5 and Exodus 20? Exodus 20, remember the Sabbath day, don't work you or your animals or your, or your people staying within you. Why? Because I am the creator and created the world in six days, and the earth and the sea. And so when we recognize and, and observe God's holy day, we are letting the world know that He is my creator. And then here in Deuteronomy 5, God says the exact same thing. Don't observe my Sabbath day. Don't anybody work, your animals or your cattle or your stranger, that they may also rest. But why? Because He's our Creator? Not, not in Deuteronomy 5. Because He's our Savior. He redeemed us. There He says, And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord brought you out. Friends, Without God, we are slaves to the devil. We are slaves to Egypt, to Babylon, to, to the enemy. But God and His mighty hand redeems us out of Satan's hand. Amen. And because He redeems us out of Satan's hand, He then says, Therefore the Lord your God commands you to keep the Sabbath day. So we keep the Sabbath day because He's our Creator and our Redeemer. He's our Creator and our Redeemer. So how many of you believe that Jesus is your Creator? How many of you believe that Jesus is your Redeemer? Well, the Bible tells us that there is a sign that shows that He is your Creator and your Redeemer, and that is the Sabbath. That is the Sabbath. Turn with me to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 20. We'll see it right there. Ezekiel is right before the book of Daniel. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12. We're looking so far at the seal of God, which will be written on their forehead, and it's the name of God, the character of God, and when he showed it to Moses, he gave him his law. So his law is his character, his name, and his seal. And even more specific, the Sabbath. So here, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12, it says, Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me, that they may know that I am the Lord who sanctify them. 
And you may be thinking, oh, but what if this is a ceremonial Sabbath? I know some have. No, it is not. Number one, it's a capital S Sabbath. And then number two, my Bible has here a reference, you know, if you have a verse and it references to another verse. This one right here, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12, references back to, let me see just a minute, Exodus 20, verse 8, and Deuteronomy 5, verse 12, which is the fourth commandment of the law of God. And notice, notice also Ezekiel 20, verse 20. Hollow my Sabbath, and they may be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. The Sabbath is a sign of creation and redemption. God is our creator and God is our redeemer. So that's why, going back to Revelation chapter 13, the issue in Revelation is about worship about worship the devil knows that God is calling us to worship on his holy day Revelation 13 verse 8 it says and and all who dwell on the earth will worship him verse 12 also talks about worship and he exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast The issue of revelation of these beasts, of this antichrist power, is worship. So the mark of the beast is the opposite of the seal of God, of the seal of God. And we need to keep something in mind, that the mark of the beast is the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is the mark of of the beast I'm saying it slow because sometimes we just say oh it's the mark of the beast the mark of the beast is the beast's mark identify who the beast is once you identify who the beast is all you gotta figure out is what is their mark and that's it so we've we've identified who the beast is already here in Revelation 13 uh, verses 1 through 10 if this is new for someone I invite you to go to our website Cleveland SEA Dot com and listen to Christ or Antichrist sermon and we, you will see here that this first beast represents none other than the Roman state church and so if that is the beast what is their mark? what is their mark? so that, that takes away the idea of the mark of the beast you know as far as being a computer chip your credit card um, a tattoo anything else You figure out what the beast is, and then what is the mark. The mark of the beast must be the mark of the Roman church state's authority. Once you figure out who the beast is, which we have, what is their mark of authority? You see, in the seal of God, the Sabbath is a mark of God's authority. The Sabbath is a mark of God's authority that He is our Creator and our Redeemer. That's His authority. So what do you think the mark of the beast is? And what is a mark of authority to the beast? And I lost my remote. Can we go to the... There, I found it. Thank you. Here it is from the Catholic Record, September 1, 1923. What is their mark coming out of their own mouth? The church is above the Bible and this transfer of Sabbath observance from Saturday to Sunday is proof positive of that act. Okay, they claim to have the power to change God's law. And we've studied this before in previous sermon, again in Christ or Antichrist sermon as well. And another one here, letter from Thomas October 28, 1895. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. They claim this. We, we have the power to do it. Now, I respectfully disagree. The law of the Lord is perfect, the Word of God says. And so they're continuing with Thomas Enrich, Enright. 
He says, Prove to me from the Bible alone that I am bound to keep Sunday holy. There, holy. There is no such law in the Bible. It is a law of the Catholic Church alone. The Catholic Church says, By my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilization world bows down in reverence, obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Except for Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Cleveland. Amen. Amen. Thank you. They claim the authority to change the day of worship. And this is their mark of authority. This is their mark of authority. And I know what some of you might be thinking, and I will answer your question in a little bit. But first, I'd like to go to another point. And if you turn with me to Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, you may say, well, what does this have to do with us? So what if they want to change it? We'll still keep worshiping on God's holy day. Well, here in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 and 12, you see, it has everything to do with it, especially because we live in this country. There it says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and had two, and he had two, horn, two horns like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. This verse we discovered two weeks ago on this beast that represents the United States of America. But notice what, what, this, what this beast does, what this kingdom, what this nation does. And he, call, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Friends, that's how it affects us. This nation causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. Believe it or not, friends, this beautiful nation that we live and that we love will enforce worship. You see, the, the, the Roman church cannot enforce worship. They can't. The only way that anyone can enforce anything is has to come through a law, through the state. They're the ones that enforce the law. Whether you want to drive 20 or not on a school zone, it's the law, you better drive 20. Otherwise, what happens? He'll be waiting for you on the other end with a nice ticket. It's the, you know, whatever the laws are of the land, they, they, they need to be done. And the church always uses the power of the state to accomplish its job. And I'll give you certain examples. How, how many of you are familiar with the story of Esther? Queen Esther. She was called for, for a specific purpose to deliver her people, to deliver God's people. But you know, Haman hated the Jews, especially Mordecai. He hated Mordecai and hated Haman hated the Jews, but he wanted to get rid of the Jews, but he couldn't do it on his own. He needed the help of the king to get rid of the Jews. And so Haman made a decree there, when you, you can read it in Esther chapter 3, he made, he made a decree to get rid of all the Jews. And the king signed the decree. But praise the Lord, God intervened through the works of Esther. But my point in that example is that Haman couldn't do it on his own. He needed a helper. He needed, he needed the state, the law, to fulfill that. Even, even in Daniel chapter 6, the governors hated Daniel. But they couldn't get him killed. They had to have the king sign a law that you cannot pray only to King Darius. And through the law, Daniel was put in the lion's den. But I am so confident and I praise the Lord that the same angel who delivered Daniel from that lion's den will deliver you and I, friends, in whatever lion's den we may face for standing on what God says. What about Jesus? Did the Jews want Jesus killed? Yeah. Why didn't they kill him? They don't have the power to do it. So what did they do? They went and pleaded to who? To Caesar. To Caesar. To the governing authorities. 
Even Caesar says, well, you know what? I find no fault with this man. Why don't you go judge him on your laws? But the Jews says, no, we cannot condemn and put someone to death. And that's what they wanted to do to Jesus. So they had to use the power of the state to fulfill their desires, to fulfill the death penalty, friends. And the papacy cannot enforce anyone to worship. So it will use the power of the state, the United States power, to enforce their agenda. To enforce their agenda. So some of you may be thinking, but pastor, it's just a day. I can, I'd like for you to tell that excuse to Adam. If you were to say, Lord, it was just a fruit. Was it just a fruit? Did, did, did they eat a fruit that kicked them out of the Garden of Eden? They didn't eat the fruit? Yeah, they ate the fruit. That took him out of the Garden of Eden. Was it just a fruit? It was disobedience. But was it just the fruit? Or was it something else? It was just the fruit. But it was a fruit that God says, don't touch. Don't touch. Imagine, for those, that, uh, uh, for those of us that are, are, are married... Imagine a married couple and one of them uh, has an affair and is unfaithful to the other spouse. Imagine if the man were to be the unfaithful and then were to turn to his wife and say, Honey, it's just one woman. Or the other way. The woman were to tell her husband, Honey, it was just one guy. No big deal. How would you, how would you take that, gentlemen or ladies? No way, Jose. No way, Jose. We expect our spouses and we want to be faithful to our spouses. Amen? Amen. God, in the same way, even more, is looking for loyalty. It's not just a day. It may be just a day, but it is a day that God says, this is my holy day. And no one can change my holy day. And if someone enforces, if someone enforces, then you need to make a decision. And you need to make a decision. It is about biblical fidelity and faithfulness to Jesus Christ, friends. Sabbath is a sign of Christ's creation and redemption. Sunday is a sign of church authority and man's convenience. And man's convenience. So what will you choose? Some of you may be thinking, Pastor, are you saying that all those who are Sunday keepers right now have the mark of the beast? I'll tell you right now, that is not what I'm saying. Because this issue has to be enforced. Enforced. He causes the earth and those who dwell in the earth to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed and receive their mark. He forces. This issue has to be enforced for it to become the mark of of the beast. Is there anyone enforcing you right now to go to church on Sunday? Yes. No. Not yet. But what will you choose, friends? What will you choose? Because that time will come. Matthew chapter 8, Ma- I'm, I'm sorry, 15. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. Here Jesus is speaking. And he says, These people draw to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Why is your heart far from them? Because, verse 9, in vain they worship, in, For in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. The commandments of men. If you keep God's commandment, friends, you cannot get the mark of the beast. You cannot get the mark of the beast. It is going to happen. It is going to happen. But as for me and my house, at least in my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. And friends, I'm not, I'm not trying to preach... Um,
denominationalism. I'm not taking favors in denominations or competing between denominations, friends. No. I'm not competing with any denomination. I just want everyone who wants to do God's will to know what God's will is. And then you will have to choose. You will have to choose who you serve. Who you serve. If you have a hard time right now choosing the Lord and His commandments, while right now we have the freedoms and liberties that we do, it will be impossible when it is enforced. So that's why I plead with you to choose this day. Choose this day who you will serve. Choose this day who you will serve. And just how those Hebrew boys stood tall when it was commanded to worship the image there in Daniel chapter 3. And they did not worship. Friends, they didn't make that decision that morning. They had made that decision months, years before that they would always be faithful to God. They were raised that way and continued faithful to God. So when, so when, as they say, the rubber meets the road, it was no problem for them to stand because they've always stood. They've always stood. And praise the Lord, God delivered them and God will deliver you. God will deliver you. So friends, if you want to choose and stand with God, I invite you to stand right now. If you want to stand on God's law and stand with God's principles. Friends, in two weeks we will talk about how this deal. You see, we didn't, we didn't talk about it, but it's, it's, it's marked here in Revelation 13. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And that no one may buy or sell except those who have the mark of the beast. It's not just coming to the Sabbath, friends. You're going to be really tested. Because you ain't going to be able to buy or sell unless you have the mark of the beast. Then God will see if we can say that we walk by faith. And not by sight. That we walk by faith. And not by sight. Friends, the idea of no buying and selling, they can do that right now. They just cut your account. You can't take out debit, write a check, use your debit card. That's no problem. So let's not you know, think or waste our time. And how are they going to fulfill that? They can fulfill that right now. But God will provide our every need, friends. Our every need. God says that our water and our bread will be sure. Will be sure. So you have no worry about being hungry. God will deliver it to you. If He, if he delivered it to Elijah, He can deliver it to you. If he, if he delivered it to Israel, He can deliver it to you, friends. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, these are your people here standing who want to hold on to your laws, Lord, who want to be faithful to you. And Lord, I just ask that you bless them, that you give them that strength. And Father God, may each one of them really take it serious to spend time with you. That is the only way to get to know you personal so that We can stand now and stand in the future. Thank you, Father, for giving us these warnings that you give us in your word. And help us to share with others the light. We do not wish anyone to go through these hard times, but Lord, we must. But we can be confident that you will be with us. So thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. Thank you for hearing my prayers. Bless your people here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.